Well, good morning. Well, today we are continuing our series that uh, through First Peter, God's truth through tough times. Today, specifically, our title is Authorities and Suffering. I was very excited last week to to bring this message. And unfortunately, I lost my voice and wasn't able to do so. But I found that as this week went on, I'm actually more excited this week than even I was last week. Uh, important topic today. If you will take your scriptures, please, and open them to First Peter chapter two. So that we might read our entire text together. First Peter chapter two. And we're going to begin reading in verse 13. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or as governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God and honor the king. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor if for the sake of conscience towards God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your souls. Let's pray. Father, as I stand here right now, I ask that I would be emptied of myself. Father, that my thoughts and my opinions would not come out. That in this short period of time, that the only words that we would hear would be the words that you have given me to speak. May those words honor you. May they glorify you. And may they point all of us, to Jesus, that he might be exalted, that men, women, and children might be drawn to him. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let me give you a little background for the message today. The other day as I was driving and I was listening to the news, which I don't often do, They were discussing how the Supreme Court had just passed the Health Care Reform Act and declared it constitutional. There were many points of view from euphoria to some that had some doom and gloom. This started me on a train of thought and I found myself asking some very probing questions. And what was it that I thought about this whole situation? Here's what I came out with. My first thought ran to that we were a Christian nation. 
We were founded on Christian principles and have experienced the blessing of God. Next, I ask myself, are we still a Christian nation? And sadly, my answer was no. Not any longer. In fact, it has even been acknowledged by our current president that we are not a Christian nation. Then I began to reflect on Obama, Obamacare and what does it mean? Does it mean that we're going to be more socialist in our form of government? And even if that's so, am I still blessed? Yes, I am blessed because of God, not our government. Next, I ask, does this change the mission that I have as a believer and that I have been called to? No, my mission and what I'm called to is still the same. To love God and others and to model the Great Commission. The next thing that I thought of was, what if God has given us as a nation exactly what we have asked for? Which is for Him to be removed from just about every facet of our lives. From our government, from our communities, from our churches, and from our homes. The next set of thoughts that I had was, What if in the midst of our nation forsaking and abandoning God, God was giving us as believers an opportunity? And if so, what is this opportunity? Can we return to a Christian nation? I thought of that for a few moments. And I thought, well, even if we had a great revival, it still would only be temporary. If we think that there will be world peace and that we will be the ones who usher it in, we're thinking wrongly. If we're going to have world peace, it will only be because Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning on this earth. Scripture is clear that this world is going to be destroyed. And then there will be a new earth. I then began to contemplate, what should I spend my time and my energy on? Am I majoring on the major things? Am I focused on the things that God wants me to be focused on? Am I trying to deal with the symptoms of sin or the heart issue of sin? Am I earnestly seeking out the lost so that some might be saved? Am I being salt and light? And most of all, Will I suffer for the right reason? Will I shun suffering or will I embrace it? Am I living out the Great Commission? These are all the things that hit me on that day. And I've been continually thinking about them since then. And I have to admit that I was moved by them. And I had to do some deep internal heart searching. There's a chance that I might be misheard in today's message. Today's message is a hard one. It was a hard one for me. For some today, you may be greatly challenged. For others, you have already thought through these things and may not be challenged as much. But it is my hope that we will all be encouraged and strengthened from today's message. Because of the possibility of being misunderstood, I have a personal request that I am asking of you, which is this. Please, please listen to the entire sermon. Don't tune me out if you hear something that you do not like or don't agree with. The whole sermon is a continuous thought that has been based on thought upon thought and built all along the way. Also, for the same reason of possibly being misunderstood, I want to give you the end at the very beginning so that you will not miss the point of this passage and the main point of this message. And here it is. Our faith should cost us something. That's it in a nutshell. Because of who we believe in, we should be prepared and expect to suffer. Christ suffered and he was perfect. We are told in this passage that we have been called to suffer. Further, we are to follow the example of Christ in how we respond 
to suffering. Suffering may come upon us by many different hands. It may be by unbelieving family or unbelieving friends. It could be from bosses, or as I expect, it might increasingly come at the hands of our government. So let's look together at our first two verses, beginning in verse 13. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. Submit to every human institution. And we're told right off the bat, governments have been ordained by God to punish evildoers and to praise those who do right. We know that they do not always get it right. And Peter here, who's writing this, knows it personally. But this is the purpose of government. This is why God established government. To punish evildoers and to praise those who do right. Notice the word submit. In the Greek, it means to be subject to, be subdued, to obey, to be under obedience, to be placed in submission. Now, before you run ahead on me, we all know and understand God's law supersedes every other human law. When human government says do this and it's contrary to God's law, we're our responsibility is obey God, but then to suffer the consequences and the results of obeying God. But let me ask you, this is God's plan. Why is it? Is it because the government deserves it? Is it because of the benefits? Is it because it would be good for us? Is it because we naturally want to do this? No. Not entirely. It's because God wants us to. That's why we should do it. It is for his sake and it pleases him when we do so. We must not lose sight of that. Let me give you some background to First Peter. And John has given this a couple of times. But Peter is writing this from Rome to those that are of the dispersion, those that are dispersed, those that are living in foreign lands, particularly here in Asia Minor. Paul is writing them, <clears throat> and he's either already jailed or soon will be jailed awaiting his execution, before his execution. Peter has seen and knows the fiery trials that are going on in Roman, of, which, of Rome, which he was already going through, and he knew that it would spread to the providences of Rome. And he wanted to encourage the saints in Asia Minor, knowing that soon they would face the very things that he saw coming. But I want you to remember, look how Peter has changed. Do you remember how fiery he was when he walked with Jesus? Do you remember some of the things that come to mind when we think about Peter and what was he like? What was his character? You know, one of the things that comes to me is he's passionate. He was all in. He was passionate. He was impulsive. He didn't always think before he was passionate and was all in. He said, you are the Christ, the son of God that God revealed to him, as John showed us last week. He walked on water. Nobody else has. He couldn't stay awake in the garden in that night of Gethsemane when Christ was pouring out his heart to God, that God might remove this cup from him. He wasn't the only one that couldn't stay awake. He witnessed the interrogation of Jesus and seems to be the only one mentioned in Scripture that was there. He denied Christ three times, we know. Peter was the first man to see the resurrected Christ. He was charged personally by Jesus to tend and feed his sheep. And he was told he would die as a martyr, that he would be crucified. And when that appointed time came, Peter said, I'm not worthy to be crucified in the way that my Lord was crucified. 
So they crucified him upside down. He knows that he is going to die when he writes these two epistles. In fact, turn with me a couple pages to 2 Peter chapter 1. In verse 13. I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that laying aside of my earthly dwelling is eminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. Peter, when he wrote that, was awaiting execution. Peter, the one who attacked the servant and cut off his ear when they came to arrest Jesus, has changed. He radically changed. He changed so much that he tells us to submit to every human institution, whether it's a king or governor. Let me tell you a little bit about the Roman emperor of this particular time. His name was Nero. He was a total reprobate. He was known for his perversions, his arrogance, and particularly his cruelty. Now, this was not uncommon for the emperors, but he was known to be especially depraved and cruel. In fact, many who study history say he was flat out evil. Many of the Christians of that day considered that he was the Antichrist. He was known to encase Christians in wax while they were alive and burn them at night in his gardens to provide light. It is believed that he started a fire that burned Rome so that he could blame the Christians. And this fire burnt most of Rome. He also did it so that he could build a new palace. But when Rome burnt, he did blame the Christians. He ordered Christians to be bound in animal skins and thrown to the dogs. Others to be burned as light at night, as I previously said, and others crucified. This is who Peter has in mind when he says, submit yourselves to every human institution. Something radical happened to Peter to change him. And he had come to understand who Jesus was and what Jesus was asking him to do. I think this idea of submitting or being in subject to authorities provides a unique challenge for those of us who are Christians that live here in America. We are not used to doing so. We are not used to the submitting of a will to another, whether it is king, the federal government, or governor, state or local or anyone else like our employers. It doesn't come natural to us as Americans. Well, we see that we are called to submit. Let's next see why we should do this, beginning in verse 17. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. I'm sorry, verse I am sorry, verse 15. For such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Verse 15 tells us why we should do it. We should do it, we should submit because it is the will of God. We often talk about, I'd like to know God's will. Here it is. This is God's will that we would do this. Additionally, if we do it well, we will silence our accusers. You and I have been freed from the penalty of sin and from the power of sin. We are free men and women, but we are bond slaves of God. Let me tell you a little bit about a bond servant or a bond slave. When there was someone who was an indentured servant and agreed to work for a period of time, at the end of that time, he would be freed. On occasions, there would be some who had a good master 
who wanted to stay with their master because it was a good way of life and they were treated well. On these occasions when it would happen, he would make that profession made known to his master. The master and he would go to the temple gates of the city where the elder sat. He would tell that request to the elders and share that with them. And upon which, after that statement, they would take him and they would take his ear and they would put it up to the gate post. They would take an awl and they would pierce his ear. And then a very specific earring would be put in his ear, signifying that he belonged to his master forever. We have been freed from the sin and the consequence and the power of sin, made alive in righteousness, but are a bond servant to God for his good pleasure. You see, we've been freed and to use our freedom in the way that God wants us to use it. Verse 17 says that we honor God when we honor all. That's what he wants us to do. Honor everyone. He wants us, when we honor him, to love believers who are suffering the same thing that you and I are. And lastly, we honor God when we honor authorities that are placed over us. Let's look next to see what God wants us to do with this freedom. Verse 18. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. Be submissive to your masters. Well, today we do not have that, but I believe the equivalency of that is our modern day employers. But either way, it's the same principle. It means to do our very best, to work hard, go beyond expectations, to do it as to the Lord, for he's the real reason that we should be doing everything that we do. This is not just to be done to the ones that we like and that treat us well, but also to the ones who treat us terribly. When we do this, we honor our Father in heaven. But when we submit to those that are in authority, and we should because it honors God, next let's see what happens and how it is ordained by God for His purposes. Look at verse 21. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in turn. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep. But now you have returned to the shepherd and the guardian of your souls. Notice with me that you have been called for this purpose. Let me repeat that. You have been called for this purpose. Do you see what it's saying? You and I have been called by God Almighty for this purpose. What purpose? That Christ suffered for you and I as an example to follow. He's calling us to suffer? Now you might ask yourself, is there something easier? And I suppose that yes, there probably is, but I do know this, it will not be according to God's will. Suffering is the primary agent to mature us in our Christian life. It is used in our sanctification. God has designed suffering to be an inescapable element in our lives that causes us to rely on Him and to shape our character and our development. There are no shortcuts. It is for our good and according 
to his will. A natural question may arise. How should we suffer? To answer this, we should look to see how Christ suffered. He was silent before his accusers. The Holy One who knew no sin became sin that you and I might be redeemed. The one who watches over us as a shepherd, nothing escapes his knowledge. God's plan for Christ was to suffer. God's plan for us is to suffer as well because of Christ. Christ entrusted himself to God who judges righteously. Christ, who could have wiped every single person out with a single word, chose not to do this in order that he could bear our sins so that we might die to sin and become alive to righteousness. Christ, the Holy One who had no sin, died because of sin. My sin and your sin. Christ suffered so that you and I could be redeemed. He suffered so that you and I would not have to pay the penalty of our sin. Christ willingly suffered so that God's wrath would be satisfied. Christ willingly suffered so that God's wrath would be satisfied. We are the beneficiaries of His suffering. Christ died so that we could live freely. He freed us from the curse of sin. He freed us from the penalty of sin. He freed us from the power of sin. Now we live for Him. For His good pleasure. We have been freed in order to be used by Him. Which ultimately may lead to others being freed as well. Regardless of how we are treated and at whose hands we suffer. We should entrust ourselves into God's hands just like Christ did. God is the only one who has the power to judge. When we suffer well and for the right reason, we will not be condemned by God, but we will be blessed by Him. In case you think I have forgotten verses 19 and 20, I have not. Look with me at verse 19. For this finds favor. For if the sake of conscience towards God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if there is when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience. But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. It finds favor when we suffer for the right reason. If we suffer because of our own sin, there's no honor in that. When we sin and then as a consequence endure a hardship, that's natural. It's simply a fruit of our action. But when we suffer for doing the right thing, when we suffer because we stand for the right thing, when we suffer for doing right, God is honored and he blesses us accordingly. You know, I think today there's much confusion about what is good and what is evil. Sometimes they seem to be substituted for one another. They're kind of used interchangeably. Some call good evil and some call evil good. How many of us in this room have seen various protests such as a gay and lesbian rally or a pro-life or pro-choice rally? Have you ever seen someone standing out in a crowd that most likely was a believer and they're holding a venomous sign for all to see? Or catch a audio clip of someone shouting some very hateful things? Do you think that kind of action might be confusing to an unbeliever to understand? I do. Is this the kind of thing that Jesus did? My attention was drawn to a story. What about the woman who was caught in adultery? She was brought right out in the very act and was set up. They set her up so that they could trap Jesus by whatever he said it would be wrong. And Jesus simply said to them, the crowd that had gathered to stone this woman, Let him who has no sin throw the first stone. 
And one by one, they dropped their stones and they left. Did he excuse her sin? No, he didn't. He said, go and sin no more. He didn't make light of the sin that she was involved in. But he also said, I do not condemn you. He was the very one who had the power to condemn her. He could have condemned her on the spot. He could have annihilated her on the spot. But he didn't. In fact, he was the only one who was there who could condemn her because he was the only one who had no sin in that crowd. You know, I find myself sometimes asking, do I remember how much I have been forgiven? Do I at times act like a judge and executioner? Do you sometimes feel the same way? What if I was standing in front of an abortion clinic, hoping to plead for the life of an unborn baby? And as I stood there, I asked myself, am I just as concerned for the soul of that mother? Or worse, would I find myself shouting damnation upon her for making a terrible decision? God is always strongly against the taking of innocent blood. Let me say that again. God is always strongly against the taking of innocent blood. What if my efforts to plead for that innocent baby fail? What will my response be as she comes out? Will I look at her with eyes of compassion? Or will I heap fiery coals upon her head telling myself she won't be saved? nor is she worth the effort. Please hear me correctly. I am not saying that saving a baby's life is unimportant. It is very important. What I am saying is that both lives are important and both are worthy of saving. I am also saying that our conduct and Christ's likeness will go a long way to being heard. In my theology, in my understanding of the scriptures, God has accounted for that baby who didn't know they had a sin nature. David said when he pleaded for his son who was conceived in adultery, he said, I will see my son again. I believe God has accounted for that life and it's still a tragedy that that baby was killed. But as am I as concerned for the life of that mother. We need to remember that that young woman is abortion's second victim. Most of the time, these women who are considering this procedure have been lied to. They've been told that it's just tissue. It's not a baby. Many, many times, these women later on come to understand that that was much more than tissue. It was indeed a baby. I think we all need to remember but for the grace of God, that could be you or that could be me. God's grace is the only thing that saves me from some of those decisions. Folks, we also need to remember these things. Unbelievers live like unbelievers. I think somewhere along the line as Christians, sometimes we begin to think unbelievers will live differently. They live the only way they know how. They only have one kingdom. And that kingdom is self. And the ruler of that kingdom is not God. Unbelievers live like unbelievers. Unbelievers sin. But let me tell you something that's even worse in my estimation. It's when a believer adopts the attitude and the procedures of unbelievers. You hear that? It's even worse when we as believers adopt the attitude that unbelievers have and then use the devices and the procedures that unbelievers use. Let us be a clear distinction between good and evil. Yes, at times we're going to be misunderstood and at times we're going to be lied about. And sometimes that cost might be very high for doing the right thing. But in doing it, we honor God and God will always bless that. This idea of suffering is not a new idea, new idea that Christ taught. How about Job? How much suffering did Job go through? 
And I love when Scripture illustrates itself. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 50. At the end of Genesis here, we are seeing the life of Joseph. And we need to remember of some of all the things that Joseph went through in Genesis. Joseph, first of all, had some of his brothers who wanted to kill him. Then they were persuaded to not kill him, but sell him into slavery instead and tell their father that Joseph was eaten. Joseph was then put in charge of Potiphar's house, and God blesses him and blesses everything that Potiphar has. Potiphar's wife lies and falsely accuses him, and Joseph flees and does the right thing, but next he's sent to jail. In jail, God blesses him. He's put in charge of the whole jail. He interprets the dreams by the two servants of Pharaoh that came. They, the one says, I will remember. But Joseph is forgotten. Then finally he is remembered when Pharaoh had a dream. But listen to this, lest you forget how much Joseph suffered. For 13 years... Joseph was either a slave or a prisoner. For 13 years, Joseph was a slave or a prisoner. And what was he guilty of? Why did Joseph suffer? It was primarily because of his relationship with God. He paid a price for that and he suffered because of it. But God blessed him in spite of it. God blessed everything that Joseph did and touched. We remember what his brothers did to him. But let's pick up right after Jacob dies in verse 15. When Joseph saw, <clears throat> excuse me, when Joseph's brothers saw that his father was dead, they said, What if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong which we did to him? So they sent a message to Joseph, saying, Your father charged before he died, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, Please forgive, I beg you, the transgressions of your brothers and their sin. For they did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgressions of the servants of God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke with him. Then his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly. To them. Joseph told his brothers, What you meant for harm, God meant for good. Joseph, after 13 years of slavery or in prison, with all that in his mind, he says, What you meant for harm, what you meant to harm me, God meant for good. This reminds me. A lot of another verse. Romans 8.28 And we know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Every single event that happens to us, no matter by whose hand or what intent, works together for our good. And God's purposes. You know, Joseph understood that he was firmly in God's hand and that nothing could be done to him that God wasn't already prepared for. Warren Wiersbe had this to say about this passage in his commentary. The unsaved world is watching us, but the shepherd in heaven is also watching over us. So we have nothing to fear. We can submit to him and know that he will work everything together for our good and his glory. 
Amen to that. So what are some of the takeaways? I want to share some of the personal takeaways that I've taken away from this passage. You may have some of these thoughts. You may have some other thoughts. The first one is, am I majoring on the major? Am I focused on the major things that God wants me to focus on? Are you majoring on the majors? Am I focusing on the symptom or on the cause? Am I focusing on the symptoms of sin or the cause of sin? Because it is always about a heart change. It is always about a heart change. What are you focusing on? I should or we should be more focused on the Great Commission than our personal freedoms and comfort. I should be more focused on the Great Commission than my personal comfort and my personal freedom. How are you doing with that? Let's stand firm. Let's be salt and light. Let's do the right thing for the right reasons. Part of being salt and light, one of the blessings we have in this country is we get to vote, unlike the Roman Empire. Are you using that opportunity to vote for right things? God would have us to vote. God would have us to stand. This world is not my home and it's not your home as a believer. Earlier in chapter 2, we are told that we are aliens and a foreigner. I should not live as though this is my home. This one was particularly stingy as the Lord pointed it to me. Am I a Christian first or am I an American or anything else first? How about you? For Christians, heaven is our home. And right now, we are representatives of that home. We are ambassador. An ambassador is someone who represents a distant country while living in a different country. We are ambassadors of a heavenly home. We are witnesses. And God has given us voices to witness with. To witness of the things that God has done in our life. To witness how we have died to sin and made alive to righteousness. We're workers and we're sowers. We're examples. We're living examples And we have been given an example in Christ. We are salt and light. Not to make this a better country. But so that souls might come to reside in our heavenly home that we know. We're salt and light so that others might have a heavenly home. At times I've found myself wondering, what are the needs of our brothers and sisters in communist countries like China? I have on a couple of occasions been able to talk to missionaries that have visited with them. And when I asked how we should pray for them, I was told that the request is that their lives would count, that the gospel was spread even under the trials that they face. Then I was told this. They do not want us to pray that they will be spared from suffering for Christ. They do not want us praying that they won't pay a cost. But here's the interesting thing as well. I'm told that they pray for us as well. Listen to how they pray for us. They pray that we might know the blessing of being persecuted and suffering for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our brothers and sisters who are suffering, pray for us that we would experience God's blessing of being able to suffer for Christ. Like they do. Let me close with this. I love the famous quote of Jim Elliott, and you've probably heard it. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool to give up what he cannot keep. We can't keep our lives, brothers and sisters. Only God can. 
But you're not a fool to give it up to gain what can't be taken away in Christ. And we can't gain it in any other way but through Christ. You've probably heard that quote, but you maybe have not heard this quote from him. Soon after graduating from college, Jim Elliott wrote this in his diary. God, I pray thee, light these idle sticks of my life that I may burn for thee. Consume my life, my God, for it is thine. I seek not a long life, but a full one like you, Lord Jesus. Shortly after pinning that in his diary, God answered that prayer. When a young Jim Elliot's life was cut short by a spear of an Aka Indian, he and several other young men sought to take the gospel deep into the jungles of Ecuador. These particular group of Indians were revisited later by other missionaries. And in fact, some of the wives who lost their husbands when the gospel went there the first time. The chief, one of the ones who threw one of those spears, came to Christ, as did most of the tribe. You see, Jim Elliott's life was not wasted. It might have been short, but it was exactly what God purposed for his life to count. Know this, brothers and sisters, no one can do anything to us that God is not accounted for, and he will give us his grace when it is needed. No one can do any harm to our soul. It belongs to God. Brothers and sisters, we belong to another kingdom. Let's live like it while we're here on the earth. Let us make a difference because somebody's soul depends on it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this passage of Scripture. We thank you for reminding us of the terrible cost of our sin. Father, that you would send your Son to suffer as a result of our sin. That his perfect life and his perfect death satisfied your wrath. Father, you give us an example and ask us to follow Christ. And Lord, if we're honest, we wouldn't ask to let us suffer. But Father, in those areas where your will is very clear, I pray that we would surrender our will and have it bent to yours. And if we have been called for this purpose, may we do it well. If we have been called to be an example and to suffer for doing the right things, and that in that suffering people might find you, Father, may we embrace it with all of ourself, with every ounce of strength, with every ounce of our being. May we do it because of what you have done and the example that you have left for us. May our lives point the way to Jesus. May our very lives and even if our death, may it honor you, may it be good for us, and may it accomplish your purposes. Father, we surrender ourselves to you. And we ask, that you would continue your sanctifying work in us, that we might resemble Jesus more and more with each passing hour. And may you be the one to receive the honor and the praise and the glory for it. In Christ's precious, holy name we pray. Amen.